Well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our briefing. It's called, After the PPACA, What Should Congress Do? My name is Twyla Brays. I'm president of the Citizens Council for Health Freedom. We're based in Minnesota, but we do work at a national level as well. So you will see papers coming out from us on things like our most recent one, which is on the National Patient Identifier. And you will see other things like on the health insurance exchanges that all have to do with a national basis. And in, when we're in Minnesota and the legislative session is in, we are working there as well, lobbying the Minnesota legislature. <clears throat> we are a um, national patient-centered health freedom organization, a nonprofit organization. We don't take any government grants. Our mission is to support patient and doctor freedom, medical innovation, and the right of citizens to a confidential patient-doctor relationship. And in the process of this um, presentation today, I hope that you will come to understand why we think that privacy and confidentiality is so important to the patient-doctor relationship and to freedom in healthcare in this country. Uh, with me today is um, Dr. Marcy Cook, and she is head of the Virginia chapter of Docs for Patient Care, and she'll give more of an explanation to you when she gets up and speaks after I do. Um, I will be answering three questions related to patient-centered care and protecting and preserving health freedom in this country through policy, whereas Dr. Cook will describe to you what, what it's like for doctors and patients today, whether or not the uh, federal health care reform law goes away or whether it stays in place. And she will talk about what um, can be done to protect the excellence of health care in America today for patients. So we've titled this presentation after the PCACA. And I realize that none of us have any idea what's going to happen on Thursday. But, <clears throat> but because our organization has some serious concerns, with some of the post-ACA pro proposals, um, both by Congress and by the states. We're going to talk from that perspective to share those um, policy concerns with you. So I'm going to pose two questions um, and share the answers and the rationale with you. And then I'll discuss where we want healthcare to go for the protection of patients and the preservation of freedom. So question number one. Should the ACA's so-called popular provisions be retained or restored in uh, federal law? We call these the ABC provisions. A, allowing ch uh, adult children to remain on their parents' policies to age 26. B, banning pre-existing condition exclusions. And C, closing the Medicare donut hole. We do not support retaining or restoring any of these, and I'd like to explain why. First, the adult children and the pre-existing condition provisions are government interference in business operations of private corporations and does not bode well for free enterprise. Second, the adult children provision has already increased the cost of family insurance policies. It's eliminated inexpensive child-only policies in at least 17 states. It has led to greater dependency of children <clears throat> or adult, young adults and crowd out as these young adults drop other insurance and go onto their parents' policies. And then according to the Commonwealth study, a recent Commonwealth study, the benefits have accrued disproportionately to the wealthy and the influential. Um, our third reason is the ban on pre-existing condition exclusions, otherwise known as guaranteed issue, would be the end of health insurance and the beginning of universal health care um, or national health care using private, highly regulated health plans. An insurance policy, as you may know, is purchased prior to an insurable event prior to an insurable event in order to protect against financial disaster if that insurable event actually takes place. But forcing insurers to offer coverage to those who have already had an insurable event, to those already sick or injured, is not insurance. It is government mandated third party financing. In other words, it's universal coverage. So what homeowner insurance company would be willing to sell insurance to someone whose house is going up in flames? Under guaranteed issue, health plans would be forced to sell to the sick. Furthermore, because, chill, because people could wait to buy insurance until they were sick, insurance policies would become unaffordable 
and even those with a guaranteed right to buy them may not find them affordable. And fourth, closing the donut hole will add to the cost of the program for taxpayers and eliminate the cost controls established by Congress. So here's the second question. Should Congress fund the establishment and operation of government health insurance exchanges? Our answer is no, and we have helped several states to say no to their proposed exchanges. If the law is overturned, states should be required to refund all the unspent dollars, and Congress should do everything possible to stop the imposition of these exchanges in the states. We view the health insurance exchanges, government-established website portals, as the key infrastructure being used to impose a national health care system. We call them federal takeover centers. And if you would look at just what the requirements are for these centers, you would realize how very involved the federal government is. The federal government is establishing a federal data services hub, and I have seen the document talking about what it's going to do. Um, that hub is a process by which the federal government will exert its federal control into the states. We listened with concern as HHS in a press conference told states to prepare for being part of a federally facilitated exchange with the federal government in charge of everything except in-state customer relations and health plan management. As opposed to how exchanges have been discussed, we believe that there are no state exchanges. There, are only, there is one national exchange with 50 Ba uh, state-based website portals. So one exchange, 50 portals. And if you go onto our website, we actually have a diagram of that, and I apologize for not bringing it. It was one thing that slipped my mind to bring. Um, so all of those portals are under the same federal law as the, quote, federal exchange, and they're all under the same growing list of federal rules. So we look at it as no state exchanges and one federal or one national exchange with 50 state portals. Um, there are at least three reasons why we remain concerned, even if the entire law is struck down on Thursday, regarding the health insurance exchange. First, HHS has given $1 billion for the establishment and IT infrastructure of the, of the state-based website portals. When an Illinois reporter asked at a press conference, telephone call, asked HHS twice, if they would have to give the money back if the law was overturned. Steve Larson, who is head of the um, CCIIO, which I hear is CICIO, or at least that's what I've been told is how it's pronounced out here. Um, Steve Larson declined to answer, even though the, the uh, reporter came back and said, you know, let me know, because Illinois was getting this money. We believe that the administration intends that these dollars be used to continue building the infrastructure for federal control and national health care into the future, even if the law is gone. Um, our second reason for concern is that various states appear ready to implement the federally controlled website portals, even if the federal law is overturned. We would like states to just say no. We, by saying no, they would make it clear to the public that this is a federal structure not a state structure. They would also make it clear that, um, they make it more clear about how the tax subsidies are related to the exchange and how expensive health, and pol health insurance policies are as a result of the only place that a tax subsidy can be given is through a state established exchange, not a federally established exchange. So by saying no, um, state legislators would essentially protect their people from greater dependency on the federal government into the middle class. And third, we are concerned because both the government and industry are, seem to be already planning to continue implementation regardless of what happens with the ruling on Thursday. So in September, it was just announced that there will be a major conference called the 2012 Health Insurance Exchanges and ACA 2.0 Summit and that is to discuss what will happen with the exchanges post-ruling. And it has pre presentations from major players across the country, including from Levitt Partners. Thus, you may be wondering if our organization, CCHF, does not want to continue down the current healthcare reform road, where do we want to go? Our focus is on the four C's of care and coverage. These four C's will lead to less expensive, less intrusive, more compassionate, individualized, customized, patient-centered care, the backbone of excellence of healthcare in this country. 
So what are these four C's? The first C is cash. We support cash payments for routine, minor, and preventive care. This will reduce costs, eliminate most expensive paperwork, strengthen the patient-doctor relationship, and encourage visible and competitive pricing. It will also allow most doctors to leave the large group practices that they have been forced into, and they'll be able to specialize in patient care to, um, as they are able to and willing to do. The second C is catastrophic coverage. This is true health insurance as opposed to prepaid health care, which is what the managed care organizations are. The uh, catastrophic coverage is a deductible, has a deductible, has a deductible as high as $10,000, which today isn't even allowed for the health savings accounts, as probably most of you know. It should also be a defined contribution policy, and it should be paid to the patient, not to the hospital or to the doctor, so that there is a two-way relationship here rather than a three-way uh, circle under which most of the controls over physicians are being imposed today. It would also provide non-health plan options, in other words, non-managed care options for insurance, and you may not know, but you're so well learned, you probably do, but just in case, um, that the federal health care reform law says that there is no um, catastrophic coverage for anyone after the age of 29. So there are a lot of people who have private health insurance comp uh, policies with catastrophic coverage who are losing them because it's no longer lawful as of 2014. And a lot of the insurance companies are already dropping those policies and their people with it. The third C is charity. Charity, as opposed to what some people might say about it, we do not consider charity a dirty word. We consider charity part of the backbone, part of the principles of the healthcare system, part of what the whole system was based on. Charity, taking care of patients who are in need of care. So charity is also less expensive than is Medicaid. Charity involves no paperwork. Charity involves giving care, not coverage, but care when you need it. And that, after all, is what coverage is about. People don't buy coverage for coverage. They buy coverage to ensure themselves that there will be care, because that's what every patient wants, is care. Um, the other thing that will happen is that there will be gratitude from the recipients, which I'm a nurse, and I can tell you, having worked with the entitlement programs, that there is often not gratitude. There is instead this whole entitlement at, um, attitude. And we would like it if the the folks who had, uh, were receiving services for free actually understood that it's coming from where? Coming from somewhere, that's not them, and to be grateful for it. Um, charity also speaks to the mission of medicine, to care for those in need. We believe that charitable institutions, including hospitals, should be encouraged to reemerge across the country as places of charitable patient-centered care. Now to the last C, the fourth C, which is confidentiality. Confidentiality is key to patient trust and timely, accurate medical care. But today, 2.2 million entities have access to the patient's medical record without the patient's consent. This is as a result of the so-called HIPAA privacy rule and because of the High Tech Act. This number is from a federal regulation. 600,000 entities have access through HIPAA and 1.5 million have access through high tech, meaning essentially, of course, that there is no privacy, despite what most of the public thinks about HIPAA. In addition, the proposed Nationwide Health Information Network, or NHIN, and the required unique patient identifier in the HIPAA law, and the $27 billion in high tech, as well as the high-tech mandate that every doctor have an interoperable electronic medical record to be put onto the NHIN, all of that will exacerbate the lack of patient privacy. Everything will be online and available to the 2.2 million entities. We view confidentiality as less about privacy than about individual control over what happens at the doctor's office and about medical decisions. So he who holds the data makes the rules. And that's the way it has been for a long time. If you've got the data and somebody else doesn't have the data, you have more power. Right now, there are a lot of folks, a lot of entities, a lot of organizations getting data on patients that even patients don't know about themselves. Even patients aren't aware of the data that's in their record. Also, this data is being used to create one-size-fits-all treatment protocols, which are placed on the doctor's computer screen where the use of them is tracked and measured. 
As one doctor recently told me, if it's not on the computer, I can't do it. So this, of course, means that doctors are not always acting in the patient's best interest. They're not able even to provide individualized patient care. They become more like technicians following the orders of outsiders. This is a violation of professional ethics and of the patient-doctor relationship. So to end these violations, we suggest that um, we, cons we suggest consent requirements for the NHIN, consent requirements for the sharing of data, consent requirements to have your information shared anywhere outside the clinic or the healthcare system that you're a part of, consent requirements for the government to access it. We would also suggest a repeal of the administrative simplification section that allows all of this to take place, that allows all our data to be made available, that um, uh, requires the unique patient identifier, the national patient ID for the tracking and linking of um, healthcare. We would also like a rescission of the, H, uh, the HIPAA privacy rule and a repeal of the High Tech Act. In our handout, we also include some suggested actions to protect everyone's access to individualized care, um, and to build a system of private health insurance that does not disappear at age 65, to move toward individually owned health insurance, preferably pre-birth, to limit the possibilities of pre-existing condition exclusions, and to protect our nation from the fiscal disaster of Medicare's unfunded liability, which is approximately three times our national debt. These uh, suggestions include repealing the prohibition on senior citizens paying cash for care. They can't pay cash for care today without it being considered fraud to the one who accepts the money. We also would like um, HHS to be prohibited from withholding Social Security benefits from anyone who chooses to disenroll from Medicare Part A. There's already a lawsuit on this, which is heading to the Federal Appeals Court. Um, we would also like to encourage disenrollment for Medicare for all seniors who have the means to care for themselves. Our vision for health care includes private real health insurance. It includes medical charity. It includes tax equity, competitive prices, independent doctors, and patient-centered care. So to conclude, our organization supports patient and doctor freedom, including freedom from government-mandated insurance and from health data tracking, government health data tracking and linking systems. We have a healthcare system only because we have patients and who are people in need of medical care. And if the system doesn't work for patients, it doesn't work. That's the only reason we have a healthcare system. So patients should be the central focus of the healthcare system, taking care of the patient's needs. Today, the mission of medicine is being taken over by the business of healthcare. Entire industries have been created which are completely unnecessary for patient care and often interfere with it. Regulations and encroachments into the practice of medicine threaten the integrity of patient care. The United States is rated number one in patient-centeredness by the World Health Organization. I would ask you to ignore the number 37 that you may have heard that we're rated number 37th in the world. After having read the WHO's report, what you have to understand is that we don't ration care and they didn't like that. We don't centralize dollars or medical decisions and they didn't like that. And we had health savings accounts with they, which they specifically said that they didn't like. So that's why they gave us a 37 rating. But they said very deep into the report that the United States is actually number one in patient-centeredness but that never really made the news. So we must not allow government and corporate interests to destroy our excellence in medical care. We must not give doctors a reason to retire. I don't know if you've seen the recent survey by the Doctor Patient Medical Association, which says that 89% of the doctors are considering quitting. So that's not what we need at a time when all the baby boomers are coming and are in need of more doctors, not less of them. So instead, we must focus on the four C's, and we would like your members to focus on making the four C's happen and to move our healthcare system back into the mission of medicine. Thank you very much.